Everybody, welcome to Revved Up for Sunday. We're the clergy of St. Mark's Episcopal Church in New Canaan, Connecticut. I'm Peter Walsh. I'm Elizabeth Garnsey. And if you're wondering where the Reverend Dr. Justin E. Crisp is, well, let's just say he's moved on to St. Barnabas Church in Greenwich. We had a great goodbye in our last podcast. You can go to episode 83 and hear the other JC. Okay, so we went from Curly, Larry, and Mo. We got Curly and Larry, and now the dynamic duo. And today we have... The world's greatest drinking story. It is John 4, 5 to 42, the so-called woman at the well. Jesus came to a Samaritan city called Sychar near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me? a woman of Samaria. Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where do you go get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. And the woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, what do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one has brought him something to eat. And Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say, Four months more, then comes the harvest. But I tell you, look around you. 
and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from the city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I've ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves, and we know this is truly the savior of the world. Ooh, that's such a great story. I hope I hope people were able to take all that in with, with that reading, but you read it so perfectly. Um, this, you know, the first thing that comes to mind, obviously, is is how you set us up. It's it's the greatest drinking story ever told. <laughs> Isn't that great? That came to me this morning. So I good. sorry for saying that my own thing was great, but I thought it was. It was it's a good one. Uh, you know, because water, you know, it's this biblical symbol par excellence, yeah. and every time there's water, there's deep, deep meaning. Even right, even right. from the very start in Genesis, where you know the spirit hovers over the waters and thing, and things are created out of it, and it's the immediate symbol of life and birth, and you know in a harsh, dry Middle Eastern desert, this this symbol would have resonated for the for these people and for John's community certainly, um, but there are just so many archetypal stories and, and touch points with water throughout our our biblical story. You know, we I mentioned Genesis, but we have the Red Sea, of course, and um, ro- when Moses takes the people into, um, into the wilderness out of Egypt and he's told to strike a rock for water, you know, he complains, the people complain, Moses doubts, you know, but the water is there for the, for them. And, um, then, you know, we have the Joshua's momentous crossing of the Jordan River into the land of Canaan and how he's, he staves off the, the river flowing and it, and it, you know, bundles into a heap so they can cross on dry land and, and yeah. the first promise fulfilled, in, you know, in their new land. Um, and John the Baptist, of course, builds his initiation rite or his rite of repentance there on the Jordan River. Um, John is the gospel where, where a sword pierces Jesus' side right. and water gushes out. And um, Jesus, of course, in this gospel claims or, you know, says, I'm, I'm the living water and I have living water. It's just so important. And then when we get to the revelation to John, he talks about how, um, I think I, I, I wrote down the passage mm. here, John, uh, Revelation 7, where it says, They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall they suffer the scorching of the sun the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters. And God will wipe away all tears from their eyes. Um, so uh, it's just, it, it, water is everywhere. Yeah. It, yeah water, it's water it's everywhere. always in the background and in the foreground. I mean, in the Psalms too, mm-hmm. how our souls thirst for water. And at the end of the book of Revelation, how water flows from the, the throne of God, the waters yeah. of life. It just is everywhere. Yeah. When I was uh, being or uh, being interviewed to see if I might be ordained a priest, I remember in the interview saying that this was my favorite passage and it was my favorite passage mm-hmm. because I was the woman at the well. I very, felt that very poignantly, mm-hmm. still am, but was oh, wow. feeling it very poignantly then for I had this thirst that I didn't understand uh, and only in Jesus was the thirst satisfied. Mm-hmm. So you're absolutely right. Uh, the living water the, that would have resonated with certainly mm-hmm. any biblical person and living water, as you know, also meant it was a stream. Uh, and, and also just the fact that this takes place at a well. Uh, uh, wells are the place, biblical wells are all, are all over the place. They're the place where uh, the patriarchs, uh, you know, they, they, they find their, their women. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're, the, uh, they're, they're the place right. of romance. They're the place of town gossip. They're the place mm-hmm. where, where people meet. Jacob meets Rachel mm-hmm. at the well and, mm-hmm. uh, and has that kind of crazy, crazy story about yeah. Uh, his pursuing Rachel uh, with a little bit of Leah thrown in there. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and so even mm-hmm. uh, uh, Jesus and the woman at the well here, I think has overtones of what um, uh, uh, the, the, the 
former dean of the El Divinity Schools, calls a story, a, a romance, nearly erotic story with a man and a woman speaking mm-hmm. alone together uh, mm-hmm. well, particularly a promiscuous woman or a woman of ill repute or mm-hmm. of of difficult reputation and Definitely a single an Jew. Yes, yeah. yes. And mm-hmm. uh, the, the conversation they have. So no, no doubt that the thing is completely full. Yeah. But when I read this story, I think of you in with reference to Jesus mm-hmm. uh, because of your love for Jesus as a barrier breaker of all things mm. social. I mean, that's one of the things that you hone to in your preaching and in your living and in your, your attestation and witness to Jesus is that he breaks down all the social barriers of, uh, seeks to break down the social <laughs> barriers that we live in. And just to name those for Jesus, I mean, Jesus breaks down the barrier of of an Israelite speaking to a Samaritan where there is bitter, bitter hatred. So mm-hmm. this is a national mm-hmm. Uh, a, a national thing he breaks down. He breaks down the gender, where as a man speaking to a woman, any rabbi speaking to a woman uh, would be the end of his reputation if he was seen publicly speaking to a woman. Uh, and and so we have that. Uh, he breaks down the, the moral codes, right? He's yeah. speaking of somebody who uh, whose reputation is dis, uh, disreputable. He's breaking social custom where... Uh, I mean, there was the issues, major issues of racial purity in Jesus's mm-hmm. day, and the Samaritans were not racially pure. They were not ethnically pure. Mm-hmm. They had lost their Jewish heritage, so that they mm-hmm. was breaking down religious barriers. They were unclean and impure. They had wrong beliefs. You couldn't mix with them, mm-hmm. and then he broke down personal barriers. I mean, he told her the truth. They went way beyond chatting. So, right. I mean, this is the this to my mind. This Jesus is the Jesus of your heart, mm-hmm. as he mm-hmm. just smashes. Every barrier that could divide this, these two people could divide humanity. He just hammers it all by yeah. sitting on that well yeah. and asking her for a drink from her yeah. bucket. Well, it's generous to describe me in that light. I, you know, I, I mean, we hope that we find the heart of Jesus in ourselves, but I, you know, I, I'm not sure I do that perfectly, but I, I appreciate well, none, of us, none of us do any of no, anything. But I do, I'm drawn but. to that part of Jesus by far. Yeah. By far, yeah. it's something that really, um, attracts me to the way Jesus is that he, um, you know, we, we so much want to categorize everyone and we so much want to keep things in their place. And, you know, this, v- this idea that there's just not enough room for everyone and there's not enough space. And if we make room for another person, we all have to shift over and change. You know, I, there's one great, commentator on this story that compares the Gerasene demoniac story to the mm. woman oh, at the well. Oh, interesting. And that's a story uh, in Mark where uh, a, a demon-possessed man is, you know, living among the tombs and shackled, and um, he's, you know, Jesus comes to him and casts out his demons, and he's suddenly back in his right mind, you know, and the idea is he's pos- comes becomes filled with Jesus and goes and Jesus says, go and tell your town folk you know what what the lord has done for you and he goes and tells and um mm, and in this good. story there's no exorcism there's no demon possession but she's thirsty and she's an outcast and she's coming to the well at noon you know nor, the her comrades wouldn't be seen with her right. because she's so her her re- reputation is so questionable mm. um but she she's thirsty and you know jesus doesn't condition anything on her behavior or getting anything right. I mean, she's just as confused as Nicodemus was last mm, week completely. about what completely. he's talking about. You know, she says, sir, give me this water so I don't have to keep coming to this well. You know, she really clearly does, doesn't get it, but her thirst is on, in the right place. She's intrigued. And so she, she too, before she's even given a drink, in fact, she goes back to town and tells everybody that she has seen the Messiah. She becomes the first preacher that that Jesus is the Messiah. And um, that's a, I love the comparison because in both stories, there's this outcast, this marginalized person mm-hmm. who Jesus spends so much time with. It's just such a beautiful exchange. And I love how open she is to, to his engagement. You know, I mean, she's you could read this in sort of a playful light where she's like, you don't have a bucket. Where are you going to get your water? And then you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well. And, you know, she's really taking him on. And you get the sense that she's pretty smart. And, you know, she's up to the conversation. And, um, you know, in a way that Nicodemus was or, or wasn't. But they, they're both given 
these hidden messages from Jesus, Nicodemus and she, you know, the, and he, he kind of, he doesn't, you know, wonder why is he so opaque? Why can't he just tell it like it is? You know, he's always using metaphors. He's always like using language that's so obscure. Like, so you get the, you, we get it illustrated what he means when he says the kingdom of God is like a pearl buried in a field or yeah. a coin hidden in the corner. Oh, interesting. Like we have to go and search for the meaning. But anyway, to land my plane, um, it's her thirst that gives her the the living water. You know, her she's saved by that ability to be intrigued and captivated and invited in, and she goes and tells others. Oh. Yeah. Yes. 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 To all that. I, I mean, I just, I'm crazy about this woman. Uh, <laughs> and Jesus, it, it, it's her thirst. And, and I do think that the, the, again, the more you pry into the stories, the better they are. She's, I mean, he's not saying to her, can I drink from your well? He's saying, can I drink from your bucket? Mm. Uh, mm. And, um, and you know you have no bucket and the, the mm -hmm. well is deep so the well uh, i'll talk a little bit about the well and in 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 jacob's well and show you some pictures and things like that but it is deep it's 100 feet deep uh -huh. and uh, if you get the water from the bucket and you pour the water in it, i can't remember how many seconds it takes before the water you can hear the water hitting oh, the right. bottom so yeah. and and they would have traveling buckets which would be like these leather buckets that you might see uh, that, that people at sea might have that could collapse down to nothing. But mm -hmm. he's saying, I want to drink from your bucket, which is what I was saying, breaks everything. This is, I'd, I'd heard a, a, a commentator say, this would be like uh, where in um, in the 50s uh, and earlier, uh, and earlier uh, in uh, down south where they would have water fountains for, for uh, white people and for colored people. Mm -hmm. And this would be like Jesus saying, I would like to drink from your water bottle. This comes from John Piper, this mm -hmm. insight. Mm -hmm. So yeah. the, the, the Jesus yeah. is, uh, Jesus's forwardness with her is, is a complete shock. Yeah. And um, this is, as you know, uh, one of the longest stories in the New Testament. It's it's long enough to be in the in the Hebrew scriptures. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean by yeah. those those it's more. In, it's an epic tale, yeah. and and the great thing about the epic tale is it's an epic tale with a woman mm -hmm. who gets to speak in it as much as Jesus does. So yeah. She gets as much airtime as right. he does. Yeah. And uh, and in the story, just as in, uh, we get something in the story which I find which. John, who is a genius, 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 genius writer, he couldn't say genius enough times, mm -hmm. uh, we get her spiritual growth through that yeah. kind of halting Nicodemus conversation right. where she begins by saying that, you know, you, a Jew, you, a Jewish man. So she moves from that mm -hmm. to a prophet. Oh, wow. You actually, you mm -hmm. know what, you know, uh -huh. you know me. And then could this be the Messiah when mm -hmm. she gets back to her people and then her people come back to town and what do we get? But he's the savior of the world. Yeah. So yeah. this is how this is personal transformation, which becomes apostle because in there, in the Orthodox tradition and lesser, but to some degree in the Roman Catholic tradition, she becomes sanctified as yeah. an apostle. Yeah, amazing. Which the church in the West, we just haven't made enough of it. No. We just haven't made enough of it. And, right. Um, I love that she, you know, in John, it's no accident that she comes, she says to her people, come and see. You know, that's right. my favorite uh, word of Jesus in the beginning of John when he's calling his disciples and they say to him, where are you staying, Rabbi? And he says, come and see. And so she she echoes that same invitation that, you know, it's, it's, I love that. I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, I know that is so great. I, I love that she's been canonized. That's incredible. Yeah. So uh, just to give everybody a little insight into this uh, in front of Elizabeth uh, on the icon is St. Fotini as she is known in uh, the Eastern Orthodox church. And then in front of me is the traditional icon of uh, Jesus and St. Fotini, the Samaritan woman at Jacob's Well. And behind that, uh, you in this icon, you can see the church of St. Fotini. And uh, if you're on the podcast, you can click to uh, a link that Rob will put up, which is an interview that I have with uh, a father, Justinian, uh, who is the keeper of St. Fotini's. And it's a little bit of a tour, and then you can go of the church and then go down to Jacob's Well and uh, get a sense of the depth of the well. Uh, those of you who are 
watching. I mean, here it is. Here's the well, and and there's uh, mm-hmm. Father Justinian, uh, and it is one of the sweetest places in the planet for me. It's such a happy place for me. Mm-hmm. But what we have here is Jacob's well dating back to the patriarchs, still alive today as a place where holy things have happened to holy people. And, and St. Fotini, uh, Fotini comes, the Fossiloron comes from the Greek word for light or brilliance, and uh, she is named the Enlightened One. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's what Beautiful. she is. Because she knows who Jesus is uh-huh. and walks his path. That's how she's enlightened. Yeah, yeah. So she's come a long way from, from the uh, the you know the woman who had five husbands. Yeah. Is, is there still water in that well? Oh yeah, there's tons of water, and the water yeah. is delicious. It is as clean and clear. It, the water is so crisply clear that it makes the water that we drink look murky. You're not aware of it until you see this water. I mean, the water is shockingly clear. Wow. Yeah. Fantastic. But not to be mistaken for the living water. The living water. <laughs> Nevertheless. No, but that's, it's a yeah. great, that's a great image. I love that. So what do you make of uh, when, when um, he's telling her about herself? I've, this is the part in the story that makes me scratch my head still. It's sort of, you know, he's told me everything I've ever done. And, you know, I guess that points to him being a prophet, but somehow she's really happy about that, even though it sounds like everything she's ever done is sort of something that, you know... Yeah, I mean, this... Uh, it, she's it, not to be proud of, necessarily. Right, well, this almost... I feel like you and Justin could have a conversation about your... about, you know, <laughs> religious formation in your childhood, about do you feel good about yourself or bad about yourself? Oh. And 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 so, for me, uh, and for the for St. Fotini, for the one with the well, the fact that he knows everything is positive. I want the Lord to know everything mm-hmm. about me. I'm not, uh, uh, you know, good, bad, and the ugly. Almighty God, to you, all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no know, secrets are hid. Mm-hmm. You know, as we mm-hmm. begin good with one. our collect for purity, I'm mm-hmm. stealing that from David Bartlett, though, and from the Book of Common Prayer, uh, which is to say she experiences her knowledge of him as as um, freedom. Mm-hmm. She doesn't she doesn't need to bear it in shame. He looks at it and calls it truthfully, but he doesn't call it in judgment. Mm-hmm. And uh, and he receives all that she is, yeah. uh, just as she is. And the the when he gets to the point where he says in the you know the father seeks such to worship him uh, in spirit and truth, mm-hmm. he's seeking her. Mm-hmm. The father, so to speak, is seeking her, mm-hmm. not seeking the perfect, but seeking her. Right. And so in the in the mission of God here, I think we're moving from uh, Nicodemus the Pharisee representing the Jewish people. Now we're into the Samaritans. Mm. And as you know, I think it's somewhere around 12 or something, the Greeks show up and then Jesus mm-hmm. says, okay, yeah. time, you know, so, and then right. on into the world here. So she, I think that this conversation, the knowledge that she has, he has of her, mm. um, she knows who he is because he knows who she is. Yes. It's another chance of, another instance of Seeing and being seen in John. Yeah, yeah, yeah. excellent. You're right. That's well said on your part. But yeah, that's, that's the beautiful. key. That's the key that that's the key to knowledge for her. Yeah. I mean, if he hadn't called out everything, she might have been, eh, you know. Yeah. I mean, Jesus says a lot of stuff about this water, right? It's a gift from God. It's living water. Those who drink it will never thirst again. Mm-hmm. Uh, this water becomes a well, and it gives eternal life. And she was still kind of like, <laughs> yeah, but I need a bucket. Uh, yeah, right. But once he gets into this stuff about yeah. The five husbands that you can almost see her going like, oh, wow. Okay. Mm-hmm. So that's mm-hmm. when she goes, oh, you're a prophet. Mm-hmm. She moves from a Jewish man to a prophet. Mm-hmm. I think yeah. she's really arrested by his knowledge of her. Oh, cl- yeah, clearly, clearly. And the disciples too, are, it's very interesting when they come uh, back to the well and they find him sitting there. Oh, I love that. They don't say anything. And I love that John says all the things they might have said. You know, it's kind of a very rare type of writing in the in the Gospels. But it's super scandalous. They're just so shocked. They're just they're scandalized by their man. Um, what are we going to do? Super about this? scandalized. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah they're, they they're, probably fear for getting in trouble, or I don't know what they're thinking. Yeah, I mean, they're in enemy territory, right? Yeah. The, the two, two peoples that treat themselves as enemies. Yeah. This, I'll, I'll, as a, a parenthesis, I'll just say that this kind of drama um, is still played out today uh, in the state of Israel and in mm-hmm. the Palestinian territories where uh, certain Israelis wouldn't be caught dead speaking with certain Palestinians and certain Palestinians wouldn't be caught dead speaking with certain Israelis. Mm-hmm. And that this is, a, this is almost Shakespearean uh, in its story where the two warring families get together and speak. Uh, This is, you know, almost 
It it's plays out in every Romeo society. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's so visceral in the in the Holy Land because of the the wall and the, the right. seriously tribal. I mean, I, once I preached a sermon about the Holy Sepulchre, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and how it was the keys keep, kept getting passed around all the different yes. sects of Christianity, and finally handed over to the Muslims because the Christians kept fighting over it. And finally, they gave it to the neutral Muslim guy living across the way that could, they'd have to borrow from, from him to open the doors. But um, there's so much fighting, fist fighting and things like that. And, uh, and in our own society, we, we all have, um, every nation, every culture has, you know, insiders, outsiders, enemies, you know, our political state is like that, you know, so polarized and um, and yeah, so it is a story for the ages in that in that sense. And even religions, I mean, every world religion has this idea that, you know, we have the spirit, only we have the spirit. Right. And it's that tribal narcissism that beautifully said, you know, um, Richard Rohr talks about tribal narcissism and how how it runs through every kind of organization and especially in religion. So Jesus just cuts through all of that stuff and. You know, he says the living water, it, or the spirit isn't limited to tribe or race or gender or any of it. It's poured out for everyone. And, you know, that's the, the total revolutionary idea in this story. I mean, there's so many ideas in this story, but that one is really important. Yeah, and he gets even super particular about it when he gets into which mountain. Yeah, so, I, I mean, we, get, going, we yeah. get the temple, uh, obviously. Uh -huh. um, in Jerusalem and mm -hmm. also Mount Gerizim, which mm -hmm. is in Nablus. I mean, I, I remember mm -hmm. being in the bus yeah. the first time driving through Nablus on a Friday morning and and the bus driver uh, or the guy, Diod, said, well, you know, here's Mount Gerizim. And I'm like, well, wait a minute, that's Mount Gerizim? And uh, and Nablus today uh, still has, is where one, about half of the Samaritan peoples yeah. uh, continue to live. And where the where Jacob's Well, the church is, is in a little, a little town outside of Nablus, it's, um, you know, where it says here in the scriptures, it's mm -hmm. Sychar. Mm -hmm. uh, that has it now has a, a different name, but it is still outside of what would be Nob Nablus. But mm -hmm. uh, so it's not on this mountain or this mountain, right. and it's one of the reasons that Christians never rebuilt the temple and have no serious claim to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, mm -hmm. because the 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 Temple Mount became the spirit and truth right. as it is presented and Jesus became the new temple. Right. That's, that's, yeah. uh, that's what's happening here. Yeah, completely. And I, you know, he's already saying that the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and truth. I mean, this is such a radical statement and, uh, and the father seeks such as these to worship him. I mean, he does sound like the prophet who's talking, who says, I do not, desire your sacrifices but you know that you walk justly and humbly and show mercy um yeah but yeah it's it's radical it's lost on us now because it's so familiar yeah i mean i think you know one of the things that would be good in, if as we continue on in our podcast is to continue to try to pull back the layers of normalcy and just to mm -hmm. see how abnormal mm -hmm. uh, so much of Jesus's behavior was and how mm -hmm. shocking and radical it was in his day. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, This is a man who would not be domesticated in any way right. uh, and always knew who he was and, and, and at times avoided Samaria because it was not his hour mm -hmm. to go through Samaria, but then other times he would go, you know, he went through Samaria. Yeah. Uh, just for those who are tuning in, in case you need a little geography here, Judea, the, the phrase where we get the Jews, uh, is in the south. In the middle is Samaria. That's now currently the Palestinian territories, but you'll hear uh, Benjamin Netanyahu refer to it as Samaria. And then the north, the third area is mm -hmm. Galilee. And so to go from Jerusalem, you either have to cut through this territory where you're not wanted, the Jewish mm -hmm. people were not wanted, uh, the Hebrew people, or they would go around to the Transjordan or yeah. the Jordan River, which is a longer walk. But this was a thing they had to contend with. And mm -hmm. we have the story of, of uh, uh, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who Jesus jokes, calling the sons of thunder because yeah. the Samaritans weren't nice to him. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I bring up that story now because 
Fotini, the woman at the well, goes and gets her people, and they come back. Yeah. I, I mean, this is utterly shocking because walking right. through these territories, they were re- you. If you were if you were a Jewish person on a pilgrimage, you were going to be rejected by these people, and now these people are coming here. Hmm. I think that uh, in listening uh, to the Yale Divinity podcast that I did on this, one of the things they were talking about with reference to erotic mm-hmm. story here is that the thing gets all tipped upside down. The man is is the seeker in the Hebrew stories and Mm, in the mm -hmm. stories of uh, the Greco-Roman stories. But here, the woman is the seeker, and she brings her people to be seekers Mm -hmm. so that Jesus becomes the attractive one. Uh And now these people come to show up. And now we got the disciples who don't know to Jesus. Yeah. And now we have the townspeople coming and the townspeople in some sense right. get it as much or more than the disciples. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, that's a huge motif in, in John. That it's, it's a lot of outsiders. And John's sort of lining up these outsiders to give testimony to who Jesus is. Yeah. I don't know what else to say about it. It's just so well, much. Let's we'll just we touch on here? one last one last spot <clears throat> here, uh, and, and just talk about uh, Jesus saying, um, you know, Jesus sends him to get food so he can be alone. Mm-hmm. Then all of a sudden they come back and he says, "I don't need your food." And he's got the whole town <laughs> out there. He can't yeah, be alone, and, and he does not has anything. And, and, and the scandalized guys are like, oh, "Wait a minute." Nobody brought him any food. Where do you get the food? I mean, you can almost hear him murmuring, biblical murmuring. <laughs> right. And and Jesus says that the food that he feeds upon, mm-hmm. uh, and this brings us this brings us right back to the really the temptations in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, mm-hmm. right, where Jesus is saying mm-hmm. uh, to do the will of God is yeah. is that's that's where my food is that right. that the, his relationship with the divine who he calls father that's that's jesus's food Mm -hmm. but again we get as we always get in john's gospel jesus speaking on this plane and everyone else on this plane right right, the divine and the earthly plane a lot of disconnects yeah and and so that that paragraph about you know what you're talking about my food is to do the will of him who sent me i mean there's so much urgency in that you get the sense that um he's talking about people saying four months more and the harvest comes, but I tell you, look around and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper's already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life. I mean, there's no um, future here. It's like happening right now. You're right. And Jesus is so into the work and, and he, it's not like post-resurrection work. It's, it's work wherever Jesus is on either side of the cross, you know? Yeah, I think that's really well said, particularly in John, where John collapses time. Luke, Luke, as a historian, might drag, not drag it out, but tell it in a more chronos, chronological mm-hmm. time like this. But in John's gospel, we get Zoom, yeah. where we get the divine kairos. Everything is yeah. the nowness of things. Right. The and of course, it's a later gospel. Yeah. So the, the community around John is already, you know, in a much more developed phase of the early church and their Christology, their idea of who Jesus is and his own sense of self and what he was about. So it can be written in this way with a, a much more high tone, I think, of, you know, calling of the work, you know, of what the work is for the yeah. community. So yeah. he's casting Jesus in this in this light that, he, you know, it, it's already been happening, that he's been harvesting. Yeah, I don't think there's the any doubt that what we get is Jesus as Jesus was, and then also Jesus understood by understood the community mm-hmm. as as living in the present. Right. So it's 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 double layered. And right. you said in the last podcast, everything here is like looking through a prism. Yeah, every word right. means more than one thing depending on which of the prisms you're looking right. through here. I mean, if we were to write a gospel of of Jesus Christ, it would look a lot different too than Mark, Matthew, or Luke, or John. Because, you know, we have layers and layers and layers of practice and our understanding of Jesus. And it would be an interesting exercise to have to write our own gospel of how Jesus walks among us and and lives with us. Um, Karl Rahner suggested that for 50 years the church should stop using the term God because generally we don't know what we're talking about oh, yeah, that's and awesome. so this this tribalist this tribalism where you know we still see today that that you know only my church or only my religion has the spirit of god um we we Ronner was talking about how you know we think we understand perfectly when we suddenly need god to justify our wars and our violence and our exploitation of other people and of the earth's resources or our dominance um you know but if we just tabled that word for a half a century and instead said 
the holy mystery, you know, it's just it's so much more humbling. It's so much, you know, puts it in perspective that we really don't know much about God and we're not in control. And um, it, I think that his aim in saying that was just to give us a big re, you know, resetting of, of who we really think we are and who we really think God mm -hmm. is. And oh. I think that Jesus is is introducing that whole idea to his people because the Jewish people, you know, there were these rules set up that about God that, you know, God ignores Samaritans, so we don't talk to them, you know. And so it's it goes very, very deep back into our own scriptures. And Jesus is right here throwing it all up in upside down and scrambling their understanding of God. So it's fascinating. Uh, Jesus scrambling everything. And I hope our podcast hasn't scrambled you too much. <laughs> uh, uh, those of you who are veterans are, are used to being scrambled right. by our scramblings. Uh, I would, uh, as we, we finish up, uh, remember to invite all of you to like and share and spread this. Uh, if you're interested in a Maranatha House Church and joining in, Maranatha House Church is being our, our small group gatherings here at St. Mark's during Lent. Uh, just reach out to us either like this online or like this if you're around or stopping by the office and Beth will take care of you. It's always good for us to mm -hmm. talk about the scriptures and to, and to pull out the, the living word because it is alive in our lives. And there's no, no greater story than this to, mm -hmm. to, uh, to launch into, to, 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 drink from the, right. to drink from the scriptures and to drink from our Lord. So uh, take care of yourselves. Uh, and remember, click on to that little video if you want five minutes of something, because this guy I interview is really a holy saint. Peace be with you. Peace.